you're upstairs in executive session, but now we have to um, <coughs> open up in our um, organizational meeting. So, Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll? No roll for this? Oh, okay. So we will move on to our oath of office. I guess we don't need to call a roll. So, Mr. Gaynor, will you come forward and swear in our um, board members who have just recently been reelected? Ladies first. successor and until my successor is elected and qualified is elected and qualified Of the United States, of the United States, and the Constitution, and the Constitution of the State of Ohio, of the State of Ohio, and that I will faithfully, that I will faithfully and impartially, and impartially discharge my duties, discharge my duties as a member of the Board of Education, as a member of the Board of Education of the Cleveland Heights University Heights City School District, of the Cleveland Heights University Heights City School District, Cuyahoga County, Ohio, Cuyahoga County, Ohio, to the best of my ability, to the best of my ability, and in accordance with the laws. Hereafter to be enacted. Hereafter to be enacted. <laughs> during my continuance. During my continuance. In said office. In said office. And until my successor. And until my successor is elected and qualified. Is elected and qualified. So let me Thank you, sir. Did it get longer? <laughs> <laughs> I think it did. It, like it. it always does. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gaynor, and congratulations, Ms. Wright and Mr. Posh. Thank you to you both. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And now we need to select a board president. Do I have a nomination for a board president for this calendar year? Yes, I would like to nominate Jody Serini as president for next year. Thank you. Any discussion? It's second. Oh, oh do I need second. second. Now, any discussion? Um, the reason for the nomination is we have a lot of work we're trying to accomplish regarding the school levy and working with Liz, our new superintendent. I think at this time we need a continuity um, within the ranks of our leadership to, in order to essentially do the job and get that done. Um, I think after the school levy, um, we can look at options. Um, we can have another organization, well, we can only have one organization meeting a year, but we could readjust leadership as needed. Um, I know Malia has ex expressed interest in some leadership role, and I think we should honor that. Um, but I think at this time, we really try, we really need to have some continuity within the, uh, within the leadership ranks. I would simply add that I, I think that, um, Jody, you've done an excellent job. Uh, it's not an easy job. It's not a job that I have any interest in. Um, <laughs> That's a ringing endorsement. It's true. Less and less interest every day, actually. Um, but uh, no, I really appreciate your hard work. It, it, it is a lot of it is a lot of work, um, especially dealing with correspondences, which you handle with with uh, 
great grace. And um, I'm, I'm eager to support you having the, the role for another year. Thank you. <clears throat> Frankly, you've done such a good job that, you know, it, it's, it makes it daunting, uh, the prospect of, you know, perhaps following in your footsteps later. And so you, you've held us to a higher standard. Thank you. And I agree. I think you've done an outstanding job. And I do think we need to stay the course considering the levy that's coming up and some of the other big uh, challenges that we're going to be facing. Thank you. Any other discussion? Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll? Ms. Ray? Yes. Mr. Posh? Yes. Mr. Hines? Yes. Ms. Serini? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Thank you all. I appreciate your show of support. And now we need to elect a, vice, a board vice president. And I would like to nominate Jim Posh for that role. Um, Jim has served admirably. He served admirably as president before me. And then he was vice president last year. And I do agree with everything as far as being able to stay the course, have consistent leadership. We've got so many things going on right now. And um, like Jim, I do think that you know we need to honor and allow other people to have more um, opportunity to be in leadership roles, and um, I look forward to making that happen. So do I have a second for Jim Se for second. Vice President? Any other discussion? The same as what I said earlier. You've both done such an admirable job. We have a lot to look up to, so thank you. You both have excellent skills, and you work very, very well together. Your skills complement each other. It's It's been very um, comforting and reassuring um, this this year. This really past two years, as you've both been in both seats. I agree. Okay. Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll? Ms. Lewis. Yes. Ms. Wright. Yes. Mr. Posh. Yes. Mr. Hines. Yes. Mr. Serini. Yes. Congratulations, Mr. Posh. Well, thank you. Remember, it's a team effort. Mm -hmm. Yes. And now we have to appoint a treasurer pro tem, and I would like to make a motion to nominate Beverly Wright as our treasurer pro tem. Uh, Beverly has been serving this capacity for the last two years, and I think she has done a fabulous job at it. Um, she knows the ins and outs of what has to be done. She um, executes it flawlessly, and I would like to see her continue in that role. So do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? I, I totally agree. Yes. yes. All no the same doubt. things as before. All right. I accept. All right. Thank you. Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll? Mr. Hines. Yes. Ms. Serini. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Ms. Wright. Yes. Mr. Posh. Yes. Congratulations. <coughs> Thank you. And now we move on to approving our consent agenda for the organizational meeting. There's a whole bunch of items on this. Um, Lots of detail, but it's pretty much all the things that have to happen to have our um, board run smoothly for the next year. So do I have a um, second or a motion to um, consider the consent agenda? I, I move, move that we accept the consent agenda. Second. Any discussion on the consent agenda? It's all pretty dry stuff, the same stuff we do yeah. every year at this time. The things we have to do. <laughs> okay, so Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll? Mr. Bosch. Yes. Mr. Hines. Yes. Ms. Serini. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Ms. Wright. Yes. <clears throat> now we have to adjourn out of our organizational meeting so we can go into our other meetings. So do I have a motion to adjourn the organizational meeting? We just have it as procedural. Oh. So just procedural? Yeah. So we're good. So, But we do need to stop this meeting and start. Okay, so now I just I was going to say, I can't join the... No, we have session. to go back to the next one. You got to yeah. go to the next one. There we go. And then rejoin. Uh, and then we have a different consent agenda. You do. We do, so but we're second. not. We've got awards and recognitions and other things before that. Oh, good. That's way more fun. But do we need Those to call more call again? <laughs> you don't. So we can but just move. I just need to pull it up here. Okay, we'll give you a second. This board docs is killing me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's got to wait for it to call. It's all good. So we can move right into awards and recognition. You can, yes. Good. Great. So I will turn it over to Liz, our superintendent, Ms. Kirby, to do our awards and recognition. Excellent. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. We have quite a few students to and staff to recognize today. 
Um, these students are being honored for their recent achievements, and I want to thank you all for representing our school district so very well. So first, we're going to start with our middle school spelling bee winners. I'd like to begin by recognizing an outstanding group of students from our middle schools. These students were among 22 student spellers who participated in the 10th annual middle school spelling bee. The students whose names will be called were the highest ranking spellers in the competition, representing both Roxborough and Monticello Middle Schools. Some of these spelling bee champs will participate in the upcoming county spelling bee on March 7th at Tri-C. And I can be a coach because I also did this. I came in fifth in this city. And I misspelled Manicotti. <laughs> I still remember that. This is not in the comments. <laughs> Congratulations on your success. Please come up front and center as I say your name. Natalie Beer. That is the best trophy. That is trophy. an amazing trophy. <laughs> I want Ruby, Ruby to go. Clara Walker. She's here. Nikolai Bell. And Sophia Muller. And a special thank you to Beth Woodside, who coordinated the spelling bee. It's Beth, here, come on up. Monticello Middle School hosted the District Power of the Pen competition on December 14th. More than 200 7th and 8th grade writers across the Cleveland area participated in this creative writing competition. It's a great opportunity for Cleveland Heights University Heights to showcase our most talented and creative writers. Special congratulations to tournament coordinator Debbie Frost and our CHUH writers. Placed at the who placed at the competition. Please come up as I say your name. Avery Bandy Zalatoris. <laughs> Ruby Tugo. <laughs> Laurel Bisher, who placed first. <laughs> Natalie Beer, who placed second. Helena Duffy, who placed eighth. <laughs> Juliet Duffy, who placed ninth. <laughs> and a congratulations to Roxborough's eighth grade team. They received the first place trophy, and they were coached by Joellen Denk. <laughs> congratulations to our winners. Please uh, pause for a photo. Nice job, guys. Good job. Next tonight, Stop the Hate is a local essay competition presented by the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage that challenges young people to consider the benefits of a more inclusive society, the consequences of intolerance, and the role of personal responsibility in affecting change. Year after year, our high school students have been entering this contest and bringing home prizes under the direction of Dr. Donna Feldman, and this year was no different. Students submitted two tolerance themed songs this year, ETAH and We Can Change Our World, which tied for first place at the Stop the Hate Youth Sing Out competition, earning a $5,000 school based grant to be used towards anti bias education at Heights. Congratulations to the winners. Please come up as I call your name Nasir Allen. Maple Bisher, <laughs> Kennedy Clark, <laughs> Grace Monago, <laughs> and 
and Emma Vale. <laughs> Dr. Feldman here, please come up. Thank you, Dr. Feldman, for all that you do to prepare our students for this competition. Thank you, Mr. David Jerns, and thank you to our Heights High students for representing our district and being responsible citizens, advocating respect for all humanity. Oh, yes. So add um, Dr. McKinney and Ms. Gould, who for years have said yes to the green sheets. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> nice tactic, Dr. Feldman. Uh, <laughs> yes, please join us, Ms. McKinney, Dr. McKinney and Mrs. Gould, for our photo. Next, we want to honor, now if, if you remember, we started one of our board meetings earlier this year honoring our AP students. Tonight, we want to honor our AP teachers. Our district is one of 250 school, do, school districts in the nation and one of nine in Ohio being honored with placement on the 10th annual AP district honor roll. To be included, Heights High had to maintain and increase the number of students participating in AP courses while also increasing and maintaining the percentage of students earning scores of three or higher on AP exams since 2017. This honor shows that this district is successful in identifying, motivating, and preparing students to pass AP classes. I want to thank our 2018, 19, and 2019, 20 teachers and staff that are all responsible for this AP recognition. This is an acknowledgement of the work done by Assistant Principal Dr. Alyssa Lawson McKinney with Equal Opportunity Schools and Heights High's effort to grow and strengthen the AP program for our students. We are ext extremely proud of you all. We also have Principal Byron Hopkins, the principal of Heights High here. Um, in, the, in the building this evening, um, who is the leader of all efforts in the building. I'm gonna ask Dr. McKinney and, and Jim Miller to come up, but I do wanna say the names of all of the AP teachers who we credit uh, these results to. In English, Courtney White and Catherine Strine. In math, Robert O'Deans, Joyce Bukovich, Kyle Baker. In social studies, Richard Wiggins, Mark Sack, Tony Bufuco, and Carl Nietzel. In science, Nicole Miller, James Miller, Odasha, Odasha Blue, and Mark Morazek. In world language, Olivia Fatika and Metha Hadajabed Woods. In art, Laura Skihan. In computer science, Claudence McCoy. Supporting AP in our guidance department is Sterling Searcy. In our gifted department, Toya Snowden. And in the AVID classes, Sean Washington. So if you're an AP teacher um, who is in the building tonight, please come up so that we can share this recognition and take the group photo. Um, I know that Dr. Um, Dr. Lawson McKinney and Byron Hopkins are also here to accept this in addition to Mr. Miller. So please come up, please. <laughs> and Ms. Searcy, and Ms. Searcy. January is School Board Recognition Month. I know. <laughs> Here we are. During this month, board members across the nation are acknowledged for the tireless work that they do on behalf of their district students and community. Now, you guys know I'm new. <laughs> And I had a vision of school boards, and I thought it was pretty, you know, ceremonial in terms of the roles, you know, more focused on the fiscal management than anything else. But I can tell you from the moment of my interview until present time, this is the most active and engaged and committed and passionate group of individuals that I have ever worked with or to be my boss. 
<laughs> they, um, I am amazed at how early and how late every weekend, holidays, this board is always working to make this the best district in our state. Um, the passion is real. The debates are heated and thoughtful. They truly represent the community and they truly are always trying to make sure that we are pushing and going to the next level. Um, we are really lucky to have this board, this board leadership. If you look around other areas across locally in the state, you know that a board that does not really work hard and work well together can be disastrous to a community. I'm so pleased that we have such great leadership in all of our board members. So just personally, I want to thank you guys um, for welcoming me, for giving me a lot of information <laughs> all of the time, <laughs> lots of suggestions, but always working hand in hand in partnership with me and in partnership with the staff as well. Um, I really um, have learned a lot, and I'm glad that we're on this journey together. So um, as a token of our appreciation, we have, um, and this aligns to um, some of the equity work that's happening in, in the district, we got every board member a copy of the book Just Mercy Ooh. by Brian Stevenson. We do have a group here in the district that is doing a book read on that. Um, and I could have gotten you guys, you know, a lot of books about leadership and business, but I thought <coughs> this connects directly to a lot of the work and the conversations that we're engaged in. So as, as I call your name, please come up and get your gift, and we'll take a group photo. Uh, Dan Hines. And that concludes our recognition. Yeah, I know, but I'm just wondering if I can. And now we're going to move in. on. You guys ready? We're going to move on to the next um, point of our agenda, and that is statements from the audience. And I have that two people signed up to speak, and the first one, I guess it's together. So Adora Schmiedel and Margaret Land, and they're here to speak about equity in our middle schools. So if Adora and Margaret can come up. Good evening, everyone. Um, especially to our board members, uh, Superintendent Kirby, fellow Heights parents and students, and members of the Heights community. My name is Adora Inzaluba Schmiedel, and this is my third board, meeting, board of Education meeting. I am learning a lot. I represent Friends of Monticello Music, and am continuing to advocate that attention be paid to equitable allocation of resources in all schools, but especially in our middle schools. In December, Superintendent Kirby convened parents and other stakeholders in both middle schools to show us, the, show us some of her first work on a middle school equity analysis that she's working on for the district. It was a great first step, and all who attended felt heard and know that there are actions being considered to address the eight topics that were considered. I did leave feeling that this is just the start of important and difficult work. After Superintendent Kirby shared some key facts and findings, we met in small groups to, pro to provide feedback to the next steps. My group had parents, grandparents, students, and community members. And two items bubbled to the top, and I'd like to share them. For one long-term, very engaged parent, there was a feeling of never being heard. 
of communi communicating issues of concern again and again, but never hearing back or hearing that another decision was made and not understanding why. A feeling of a lack of transparency. She said that she wanted to trust the findings and directions that were happening that day, but she was not able to let go of past distrust and expectation of disregard. Her question was how to rebuild trust. What activities could be proposed to our PTA at Monticello that could signal that this is a new day and that dialogue is welcome and responses will be made? For the student at our table, he questioned what true equity looks like. He told us that in his elementary class at Canterbury, he was surrounded by students who were taking music lessons in addition to what the school offered. At Monticello Middle School in sixth grade, he was surprised when only one of the students in one of his classes had had music lessons. He talked about how his Monticello peers said that they had no expectation to be in advanced orchestra or band in high school because that was not for Monticello students. But these were his feelings. His next step, which really impressed our group, was to ask for a survey in continuation of the superintendent's analysis. And the survey would be to see how many students in each middle school have access to additional music lessons. And what is the middle school, what is the, um, the percentage breakdown of the advanced music programs in the high school by middle school. Armed with these facts, he wanted to know what equity should be. His question was, is it now just equal resources for everyone? These are difficult questions with no immediate answers. I know that there are difficult conversation tactics and actions that still need to occur. I look forward to these next steps. I am proud that our district is starting this process, and I look forward to seeing the actions proposed that reflect answers to many of these hard to hear questions and concerns that will continue to arise. I want to leave you with this. Equity isn't the thing to solve. It is the solution to the problem. The problem should be defined by disaggregating data finding communities that are most impacted, and asking the right questions to really understand the underlying systems in place that hold people, or in this case, students, back. Once the problem is defined, equitable solutions begin to present themselves. I await, as all of you do, equitable solutions. Hi, Margaret Lan, also attended the equity meeting at Monticello, and I wanted to say thank you for holding that meeting. In my group, there was also a parent that was a longtime parent who no longer had middle schoolers but still had children in the district and expressed much of what Adora also said in that for years they were asking to be heard. And so I appreciate the swiftness that what, with this response that this meeting was held. Um, but as a parent of both an eighth grader and a sixth grader, I'm looking for what happens next. When will we hear about maybe some of the proposed changes taking place? What is the next meeting? Um, I realize that we were discussing both some immediate solutions and some long-term solutions. And I would love um, maybe a calendar, a little bit of a timeline follow-up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming and sharing your thoughts with us. We appreciate that. Oh, um, I can talk about it in my report. Okay. Yeah. I'll respond when I get to my report. I'll talk about next steps. Yeah. Okay. Great. So we will move on to the consent agenda now. So do another speaker. No, they, it was, they were together. Oh, okay. They signed up together. Okay. So, um, consent agenda, do I have a motion to approve our... Oh, Excuse yes. Me. This is the first time I've been to one of these meetings, so <laughs> I'm new to this. And I wasn't aware that you had a sign-in sheet to ask questions. Do you have a... Yeah. Where did it go? 
Mr. If you would like to speak, if you can at least sign the sheet. Sure. It's so we have your name spelled correctly for the minutes. Oh, Is it really why we well, need you to sign it? <laughs> <laughs> and for anyone who's new who wants to speak, typically we um, have the sign up clipboard out there about 10 minutes before the meeting. We ask people to sign up. And mainly we ask you to sign up so we can get your name spelled correctly in the minutes and we have a way to follow up with you afterwards if we need to do a follow up. Thank you. So, Mr. Mark, is it Deacon? Deacon? Deacon, if you can come up, his topic is the levy. My name is Mark Deacon. I'm new to the uh, board of coming to the Board of Education meetings. This is my first attempt. Uh, and my question is about the levies that uh, one is going to be in March for, uh, I believe it was the 7.9 levy. Does anyone in the school district, the board, the teachers, the administrators, does anyone take into consideration the senior citizens in this community, U University Heights, Cleveland Heights, who are on a fixed income or uh, the, the working poor, the middle class who still have a hard time making ends meet because of the taxes in this city, that we have a difficult time. I'm disabled. I'm on Social Security disability. I believe me, it's very difficult. My wife is ill. I take care of her. So. Every time I look at our, our tax bill, I see how things uh, are going. Taxes keep going higher. I can't get the house fixed. I can't get anything taken care of because Cleveland Heights School District has decided that the teachers need more money. Like I read in, in uh, the patch that uh, teachers voted for a one-year um, um, contract because they want a pay raise every year. And that means so they get a pay raise every year, they get a benefits taken care of every year. So I found that to be interesting. That the teachers want more and we get less. We lose our, we keep losing money out of our paychecks, our social security, and the, the administration, the teachers, the, whoever else keeps getting more. For only working a short time, per year, every year, they make an ungodly amount of money. Now, I'm, I'm sure most of them don't even live in Cleveland Heights or University Heights. I'm sure they live out of the area. So they pay less taxes than anyone else here in this, in this uh, school district. So they live quite well. I'm sure they drive around in new cars. They could take vacations. I haven't taken a vacation in 30 years. I had children I had to raise. I had an ex-wife who didn't work, so she, you know, I did all the working. So, you know, it's, it's something that, that the Board of Education, the teachers, and uh, the administrators have to start thinking about. Because a gentleman ha uh, on next door had the right idea, and I thought about it myself. Stop paying our taxes. We can do that. All we have to do is put it in escrow and say, no more. You want it, you're not getting it. And then let's see what the school district can do without our tax dollars. You'll get it from the ones who want to give it to you, but you're not going to get it from the ones who don't. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. We appreciate you sharing our thoughts. So we'll move on to our consent agenda. It, Jody, I know it's not, I know we're not in a situation to answer any questions, but we do have a forum coming up on that the That is 9th. true, yes. On Thursday night, so today's Tuesday, Thursday night at the high school at seven o'clock, we have a forum where we're gonna discuss um, school, we're gonna discuss school funding. And we invite it's you to be the there. School. It's at the high school, yes, in the auditorium, and I invite you to be there. I will be there. Great, thank you. What time is that? Seven o'clock at the high school in the auditorium. So January 9th. 
Thank you. So I will move on to our consent agenda. Do I have a motion to consider, consider the consent agenda? I motion that we consider the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion on the consent agenda? There's quite a few things on it. Um, one question. Uh, the school mapping software that's down in under one of the contracts, I assume we use that for transportation. Is that also the same software we use for enrollment and the other GIS stuff? I know it's an arcane question, but I was curious. George, you want to come up and answer that? Or? I'll, I'll get back to you. You'll get, you get more information. Okay. okay, that's fine. I'm just curious. And then on a personal note, I'm sad that Melissa Lewis will be leaving us because she and I swap emails all the time. <coughs> she keeps forwarding everything that's sent to her that's destined for me because M underscore Lewis. But anyway. That's all you. Right. Are the trips part of the consent agenda as well? They are. They are. So I just love the trips that we have, um, you know, that our students – um, in fourth and fifth grade are going to go to um, Cuyahoga Valley National Park. And then our high school students are going um, to Costa Rica this year um, for a wonderful um, hands-on environmental experience in Costa Rica. And the um, vocal music department's um, annual tour uh, this year is going to Baltimore. And as... Um, Beverly and I both have fond memories of um, our vocal music tours. I, um, I celebrate all of those. And it's just another, to me, this is yet another example of the um, incredible educational opportunities that um, our students take part in all the time that are just part of the who and the, the who we are and what we do and how um, these incredible opportunities are brought forth through our amazing teaching staff and with a great deal of fundraising from our parent organizations. Um, so uh, bravo to all of them and safe travels. And I'd like to um, just uh, have a little discussion regarding the, um, the tour because the tour, I guess the tour have been cut back um, on the days the students used to they used to stay at least for five days or a week, and now the tour is cut from for two days. And I just think the cost of the tour, I know some time ago, back in the day, the students were able to sell tickets and put have um, a, proceed, a part of their ticket selling to go into their accounts, into their tour accounts. They were able to sell candy. Um, they were able to sing. It was a lot of things that they were able to do to pay off their tour. And the tour is costing almost $700. And I think that's, that's kind of, that's high for two days. And, and, you know, I think. And I just would really like to look at possibly allowing the students so they can also be a part of this, be a part of the experience, because I understand it's only 65 students that will be going. But if we can make it, a way where the students can go back to paying off their tour accounts as opposed to, you know, just coming up with the 600 or $700 that, you know, all, everyone can't afford that. I think there may have been some state, some laws changed to fundraising. I remember we used to go for a week when I was in Heights Singers. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember selling candy bars and, um, my understanding, perhaps Scott can clarify, I believe, though, that um, the fundraising that is done today isn't student-specific anymore, that state guidelines have said that it's all uh, trip-specific? Correct. Yeah, there, it, it became an equity issue of, of okay. some students who were able to, to do that in support and others who were not. So um, there, was, there were guidelines that, um, that came down that the, the trips... Uh, that students can still fundraise, and we mm -hmm. hope that they fundraise, but that, 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 that went to offset the total cost of the trip mm -hmm. across all students versus individual students being able to fundraise for their own accounts. Okay. If we can possibly, and I see our 
fundraisers are are here, our foundation, you know, if we can look at just kind of making it a way where students can either participate or make it easier for parents and families. Good point, Beverly, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to thank the community members who gave donations that we're about to approve as well. So, all right, any further discussion on the consent agenda? No. Mr. No. Gaynor, will you call the roll? Ms. Wright? Yes. Mr. Posh? Yes. Mr. Hines? Yes. Ms. Serena? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. All right, and now we are moving on to the superintendent's report. All right. So, Liz. Thank you very much. We're going to start first with um, a high schools foundation report. So, uh, Juliana <coughs> will walk us through um, our report. I see it here, but not there. I don't know um, if I get any help with that. Um, I gave you my It's showing, so people can follow along. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New I know Year. you have a really busy night tonight, and I appreciate you squeezing in a few minutes to just hear an update of where we've been in the last year and where we're headed um, uh, at the Heights Schools Foundation. So uh, just so we're all thinking in the same direction, this report tonight is focused on uh, my dual role, uh, I, I contract both with you, um, the district, and also the Height Schools Foundation. On the district side, I provide strategic development uh, recommendations and analysis, and uh, under my title as uh, the development specialist, and on the Height Schools Foundation side, I serve as the executive director of the Height Schools Foundation, which, as you know, is a separate 501c3 uh, public benefit charity that supports the strategic goals of the district. Um, so this meeting is just one of many ways that I report out um, and to you, but also to uh, the Height Schools Foundation uh, particularly. So, on the High Schools Foundation side, we have 19 board members now, um, and those Board of Trustees members are the fiduciaries for the organization, and they've developed a range of internal policies that are related to accepting and managing gifts and investments and have detailed financial reporting at its quarterly meetings. They also now have established various committees that meet between full board meetings, and that includes governance, finance, and events. And in addition, I meet two to four times a month with President Susan Carver, who's with me tonight, Treasurer Megan McMahon, who is with us tonight, thank you. And then also with me tonight are some of our trustees, if you'll um, raise your hand, Tim Jones, um, Shanice Settle, Ed Long, Pete Shriver, who also serves as our secretary, um, and also uh, people who play dual roles over here, um, Ms. Kirby, and Mr. Heinz also serve as full voting members of the Board of Trustees of the Heights Schools Foundation. And so first, let me just thank all of you for being here who serve in leadership on the foundation. I can't tell you how much I enjoy working with all of you and appreciate the efforts and, that have helped bring us here uh, today. Um, as you know, our organizational connection is governed by a memo that explains how we collaborate. It was approved last fall by both the high school foundation trustees and by this body and as part of that understanding I submit to you written quarterly reports and I'm actually working on one this week that's going to help add any detail uh, to anything that comes up tonight that we don't have time to talk about because I have just a short window on your agenda tonight. So we'll take good notes and if there's anything that you'd like to know more about, I'll make sure it lands in that report that you'll have by the end of the week. So we are your internal nonprofit partner. We're the preferred depository of private gifts that benefit the district and its students and we manage scholarships, special funds, endowed legacy gifts and more. And uh, those who are interested in learning more about how to contribute to the foundation can contact us directly 
and we'll work with you to determine the best way to make an impact with your gift. I had to just squeeze that in there. <laughs> okay, and so uh, please know that we're all happy to answer any questions that we can't get to tonight um, in lots of ways. And you guys know that we're housed here in this building, um, including our uh, growing contracted staff who are helping us to achieve our goals and we're always around and available during regular hours to meet with you. Okay, so I'm gonna speed through a few overview slides just to kind of update you on the work that we've been doing, and then we'll make sure we save a few minutes at the end to see if there's anything I can fill in while I'm here in person, and I'll ask Dr. Carver to join me in just a couple minutes as well. Okay, okay, good, it works. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, we do have some new faces who are helping us to achieve our goals. Uh, Betsy Friedlander is starting her or is just about to finish her second year uh, part-time as the marketing and development coordinator. Um, she also manages, I kind of think of her as reunion uh, central. She manages uh, working with the reunion groups, letting them know what you can and cannot do in our district and our buildings, and she sets up and organizes the group tours that we manage for the district. Abby Sender is brand new. Uh, she's been with us now for almost three months, and uh, she was brought in specifically to reach out to our Hall of Fame members and to uh, run a campaign to organize for the 40th anniversary of the Hall of Fame, and we'll touch on that in a little bit. And then lastly, uh, Deborah Odin, whose name you may recognize because for years she was at Roxborough uh, Middle School as a social studies teacher and MSAN coordinator, and We've begged her to come back out of retirement in just a tiny way uh, because she knows a lot of people in the district. She is helping to solve problems around the implementation of the transportation and after school programming grant and we'll touch on that um, on another slide. So I mentioned Alumni Connecting, we're still Alumni Central. It's just that we're so much more than that that it almost seems like, you know, it's just this little slice of the pie when our history is that we were really all alumni all the time. And now we've just brought that really good, the best of that work forward and added to it. So for instance, when I say added to it or reinvented, I mean like reinventing what homecoming weekend looks like. So this year, I'm so excited to tell you that more than a thousand people were in the homecoming parade that went down our uh, main street on Lee Road and um, hundreds and hundreds more were there to cheer them on. Um, it's exciting to see homecoming uh, turn into a weekend where people wanna come back and celebrate the city and the schools. Uh, we are the, uh, we manage the process of creating the Heights Magazine that happens twice a year. I am the founder and managing editor. I create the, uh, some of the content I, content, I manage contractors who bring us the other content as well as the designer. Um, and I create the theme uh, <coughs> for each issue. We collaborate with the district on this. This is a great example of our kinds of collaboration where as we intersect into the communications department, we um, get content from uh, members of that department um, and other kinds of support and Kathan and I work in conjunction to kind of put the magazine to bed uh, when it's ready to go to print. Um, so a new issue is out right now that celebrates the opening of the uh, middle schools. Uh, we also manage the historical archives on behalf of the district. You may not know that it's here now, back in the old, on the other side of the bus garage, right? I think people think of it, although most recently it was Sports Central for the high school, really people think of it as the bus driver's lounge, I found. So if that rings a bell, <laughs> you have to walk through the bays to get to it. Uh, thank you for using that space to uh, bring together uh, archival materials. Because we have a home base now, what's happened is uh, throughout the district, there's a whisper, hey, if you find anything, send it over to the bus garage. And periodically, I'll go back there, and there's just a new box, a treasure trove of materials that came from someone's closet somewhere in the district. So having this centralized location has really grown the collection. Um, 
And we have a team of volunteers who come in weekly and they're really the lifeblood of this project. They're opening boxes and just, we're, we're like an unboxing video on YouTube. You never know what you're gonna find. <laughs> um, sometimes it's fantastic, sometimes it's just recycling. Um, but we uh, are working to stabilize um, the storage and to create digital records of what we have. Um, to that end, we've partnered with Mr. Tarter, former um, gospel choir uh, director and staff person, the founder of the gospel choir, actually. And we have digita digitized and uploaded his entire collection of gospel choir concerts from the 1980s and 90s and early 2000s. And they've already received hundreds of hits on YouTube. And uh, alumni who are part of that program are thrilled and excited that those are available. That's the kind of work we want to keep doing. So we partner now with the Cleveland Heights University Heights libraries, and they are digitizing our entire collection of black and gold newspapers, which is amazing. And uh, we just created a brand new partnership right before the holiday with Cleveland Public Library. They now house a complete collection of our cauldron yearbooks in perpetuity. And they are working with us to put us on their list to, to take on the digitization of the cauldrons, that's new, just oh, just happened. Even to, even our board <laughs> members don't know that yet. It happened right before the holidays. Uh, <coughs> so we're really excited about that and we believe those partnerships with the libraries are gonna lead to funding opportunities so we can staff this effort properly. Um, okay, so I mentioned Abby Sender, uh, our newest uh, addition to the team and she is working on the Hall of Fame uh, as her primary role. Uh, we, I'm happy to announce for the first time tonight that we have co-chairs of the uh, uh, 40th anniversary committee, and it's uh, Jules Belkin, uh, class of, these are both Hall of Fame members, class of 1949, and uh, former Ambassador Gina Ab Abercrombie Wynn Stanley from the great class of 1976 have agreed to co-chair our efforts and they will help us reach out to the full list of Hall of Fame members who we're inviting to help ensure that the Hall of Fame will exist for the next 40 years. Looking forward to sharing more details as they come together. Uh, Shark Tank, some of you have been there or participated. Thank you to uh, board member uh, Molly Lewis, who recently uh, was convinced to serve as a shark. It was a lot of fun being a shark. <laughs> it was really it's it fun when you can give out the funding, right? Um, shark Tank is about promoting excellence and partnering on professional development with the district and working to share great ideas between staff and between buildings. And uh, we fund projects through that um, system that helps kids thrive. And I'm happy to tell you that we've awarded more than 62 grants in, in the three Shark Tank uh, campaigns that we've run in the last two years. <coughs> um, scholarships, um, I want to highlight this area. And when we started our scholarship effort, uh, was pretty modest and it's beginning to grow, but it's still pretty modest and our sense is that there is real potential and interest in expanding our scholarship program within our community, within the alumni community and within the greater community as well. So uh, I look forward to talking to you more about this in the coming year, but our board has made it one of its strategic priorities uh, for the near term and medium term future. Um, so, how are we doing? Uh, is the model working? I, I think yes. Uh, since its creation, we have contributed over $250,000 back to the district. Um, in the time that we've been functioning as the foundation, we've raised more than half a million dollars. Um, where's the rest of that funding <laughs> if we didn't give it all to you if you're doing the math? <laughs> um, uh, we have about um, $215,000 that we're holding uh, for designated purposes um, that would be distributed over time. So uh, what I mean by that is, um, we, for instance, we're currently holding uh, $14,000 in uh, arts education funding that will be paid out over the next year. Uh, ditto on Holocaust Fund. 
Um, and then in addition, we have some um, funds that are meant to be held in perpetuity, um, and that is a, a, something that will be growing in the future. Um, and then the, um, of course, the income, investment income uh, is used, in this case, for scholarships. Um, so uh, the work that we've been doing through all the grants that we funded, arts education, and on and on, have impacted uh, more than 4,000 students in just the last school year. Uh, so what have we been funding in a little more detail? Uh, because of a wonderful partnership, we've been able to fund uh, creative arts and sciences at all the elementary schools and the middle schools, uh, lessons of the Holocaust and MSAN related work, a course music and arts education, and family engagement. Um, you know, really we do almost nothing on our own. Everything is a strategic partnership uh, because that is, it's better work. We're making our work um, not only more relevant, uh, but more efficient. So we partner with Rox Arts as an example of a strategic partnership. Um, and we have a two, currently have a two-year agreement that we're six months into where each elementary school will receive $3,000 this year and next year for creative arts and science fund, you know, projects, and then the, each middle school has $4,000 per year. So that's pretty exciting. And um, I'd love to call up Dr. Carver to join me to talk a little bit about our visioning process. Thank you, Juliana. And thank you to Ed and Janice and Tim and Pete and Megan for coming out today to support our wonderful executive director of High Schools Foundation, who I love working with. So I've had the pleasure over the last year to, as president, to lead our wonderful team of board members in coming up with our vision, our mission, and then priorities. And it's been a lot of fun. We've had to do it over several meetings. And I have to tell you, we've crafted every word. <laughs> so, <laughs> truly, we've looked at every word. They're familiar with that. Yes, <laughs> I'm sure you are. So vision, as you can see auditorily and visually, our vision is <coughs> once a tiger, always a tiger. And you feel that as an alumni when you are anywhere in the world and you come across somebody who's attended heights. You just, oh, you're a tiger. Automatically common ground. Mission is to engage our alumni and community members and you saw this in the opening slide, to celebrate our past, embrace our present, and support our future. How do we do that with our priorities, all right? We, um, and this is again, we've crafted our words, fund enriching educational experiences to help kids thrive. And we are certainly doing that with regards to our Shark Tank and our Holocaust and MSN, uh, the Minority Network, and many others. And we'll work to have more. Um, facilitate community and alumni investments to build stronger schools, all of the schools, which is one of the wonderful things about the Heights Schools Foundation. It's no longer just alumni. We have our K through 12 schools. Support the graduates with increased access to scholarships, which you've noted, which we do every May, and to leverage our alumni network. This is really important. Um, across the generations for mentorship, we really would like to reach out to our alumni and encourage them to connect with our current students and recent graduates for our mentorship. Awesome. All right. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, part of what's been so energizing and working on the mission, vision, and priorities with this organization is that um, it's been an asset-based conversation. So um, when we think about our amazing um, alumni, I, you know, we know it's more than 50,000. Um, we manage an active database of 42,000. Um, that's such a powerful network. Um, and what I've learned about uh, our district is that alumni means a lot of different things. Once you're in for any reason for about a month, you are permanently a tiger. <laughs> so if you worked here in the district for your first year out of school and then you may have ended up somewhere else because of an opportunity or whatever, you are a tiger forever. Um, if you were here with your family for a while because of a job, had to relocate, but your kids were in our schools for a time, you are a tiger, everyone in your family forever. And we find that those connections really are strong. It isn't just amongst the um, graduating, uh, those who graduated from the high school itself, um, but it's much, much broader than that. And we know that just even from the 
level of activity that we see with our retirees group as just one example of what a rich and active organization that is. And I uh, certainly understand this concept of once a tiger, always a tiger. So when I had the privilege of addressing our new staff in their orientation, I warned them that now they're in for life. You know, that they had made it to day two of orientation and they're forever uh, a tiger. Um, so uh, in, I'll just end with um, leaving it open for questions, but to just remind you that um, your investment is really important in our success. Um, we can't do the work without you and our other partner organizations. That's really our whole approach to our work is about collaboration. And so we're grateful for the chance to work together on this endeavor. I'm happy to touch back on anything. We kind of whipped through things quickly and then to take any questions that I could either answer now or in the memo. I have a thought about college scholarships. Great. Um, we have a lot of alums and community members who um, fund multiple small scholarships. And if you go to that event every year, there's a bazillion different $500, $1,000 scholarships. Mm -hmm. um, but for some of our students, that's not sufficient and you'd have to piece together a zillion of those to be able to go to college. Yeah. So, you know, how do you, how do you cultivate big numbers so that we would have a few, you know, named special scholarships that make the difference for a student <coughs> between going and not going? I, I so appreciate the question. That, that's a whole meeting. Oh, sorry. And more. <laughs> but um, I'll just say at first a few thoughts. One is I, I totally agree. Um, one of the things we've done, uh, even though we know $1,000 is not enough, that is the minimum that we give out. Uh, we don't want students to go through an extensive application process for a $100 prize. Um, so we do have a minimum requirement. And we also have a minimum requirement on creating a named scholarship. Um, or named special fund, all kinds of things, in order to um, communicate back to donors that it takes a lot of work to organize scholarships. And I know you guys all know what a process it is and that we, we can't even give out our scholarships without our partnership on the high school side with the Scholarship Zone and Ms. Floxen, who uh, corrals students and helps with paperwork and helps students know. And I, I think it's time for a much bigger conversation and kind of a rethink in how we're approaching scholarships. I think of that partly as a parent and my own experience going through that process with my, my teens and, and what it means to seek the level of funding that families really need access to today to get their kids through the process. So. I would say this, it's important to look at scholarships in context of all of the work that we're doing at the district. I think about Nancy Pepler's work, and she would say, it's a big continuum from one to 10 of all the steps we need to do to make sure that at 10, kids will successfully graduate from college. So scholarships is like eight. <laughs> and so all of this other work that's happening in the community partnerships world as we think about all the things we need to wrap around our students and connect to our students in terms of services and support and experiences to make the college, uh, well, accessible and even possible and imaginable, mm -hmm. um, and then ultimately successful. So think of scholarships as just one of those things on the continuum. It's maybe eight, maybe nine, but it's, it's really important because you could get all of these other things and then not have the funding to go, and that is a very sad story. I think we can all agree that we don't want to be the district that can get kids all the way here and can't figure out what to do next. So I think there's a bigger conversation to have. And I will just say that my experience is that people feel very passionately about helping, uh, to, about leaning, reaching back, and helping other people come the same pathway that they came. And so I think there's a lot of potential. Thank you. Juliana, you just spoke a lot about scholarships, which I greatly appreciate. Yeah. Um, 
you focused on college scholarships. Do we have anything for career technical education kind of scholarships? Because, you know, there are kids who want to do something different. Yeah. And, and they need certifications to do that. Thanks so much for saying that, Jody. And I'm going to work on my own language on this. This is really important, that we need to say more about it's, it's post secondary education opportunities, certification, and degrees, right? Mm -hmm. That it's much bigger than that's just a lot your of words. Right. <laughs> it's I know. Problem. So yeah, I'm gonna right. figure out what that sounds like. Uh, thankfully there's many examples out there from other communities. But yeah, I, I totally agree with you and I think that it, that's universally felt that there are many pathways to successful um, life, life success post secondary education. And that could be certification. That could be all kinds of things. Could be yeah. trade school. Could Absolutely. Be lots of things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if I could just add one other thing, picking up, first of all, my Heights Choir went to Baltimore on tour. Yes, I don't want to tell you what year that was, um, but that, I'm so excited when you, <laughs> yeah, right. I was very excited that they're going again, because I remember that very fondly, and it, so that is wonderful that that tradition continues. And um, I have spoken with other uh, schools, foundations in the first ring. Um, who um, have uh, travel funds. And so that's a conversation we can have. Um, we're already offering some funding support to the Costa Rica trip and others here and there, but um, tr the, the trips require big, big funds. Um, so it's an important conversation to have about what are our strategic priorities, and if, if that's one, happy to partner on, on what that might look like. But we know that the field trips which our students have the opportunity to go on are life-changing. We do, yeah. um, And the more students we can provide that opportunity for, the better. And, you know, some of them are Baltimore, some of them are Costa Rica, some of them yes. are Kent State, some of them are, you know, Tennessee State. And, and, yes. But they are all life-changing in one way or another. Yeah, these intensive experiences, you think about how many hours cumulatively a student is having, and even just an overnight experience. It's one of the reasons that we focus the Holocaust Fund as an example on these intensive overnight experiences. They're often just you know, 24 hours, 36 hours, sometimes two nights when we can pull the funding together, but those intensive experiences those are the those are the takeaways. They change at minds, attitudes, aspirations. Um, couldn't mm -hmm. agree more. Yeah. And the Cuyahoga Valley is the first overnight our students have access to, because then after that they go to D.C. in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And and the the nature overnight is great. It's fun. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning you know, that. You know, there's really a lot of. It, it almost seems like that there's some need for some kind of funding clearinghouse. Um, the ro robotics club is yeah. in, in dire need for sponsorships for this program that they're putting putting up. Um, we have kids in middle school that are looking for lessons. Um, it would just seem to be that if there was like some hot sheet that came out, I mean, this this is, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to propose a solution, but just right. throwing yeah. an idea out there, Please. not that this is the solution, because I have no idea if it is or not, but I mean, it's almost like you, you, you throw out a need sheet, it's like, and it goes out to everybody, and it's like, we have 10 kids in our middle schools that need um, music lessons this month. We have, you know, $2,000 of need for a robotics club, um, event. We have this, we have that, we, we need 10 volunteers. This is over your scope, okay? No, um, but you're, that, you're right. You know, that, yeah. can, that right. can step in and help our elementary schools because we don't have a parent support net, network in a lot of these classrooms, so we need parents to show up um, and, and help out in the classroom or go out on a field trip. Um, yeah, what you're saying is is revealing this, I think, a, a much bigger conversation, but it's so important to at least touch on it. And I'll say internally, one mm -hmm. of the ways that we're beginning to, to think more strategically about this is in my planning team, that is Nancy Pepler uh, from, you know, Community Partnerships, who's thinking about all of these connections and how do we m most strategically utilize what our partners can offer. And then we're also, then we meet with career tech um, and family engagement and um, 
Sue Pardee and, and federal grants and uh, Megan McMahon, 21st Century Grants, and we think about where our intersecting points are about funding meets need, how to identify need, and then how to find the funding to meet it. We all work on different parts of that, and I think this internal planning team is really helping to, and it, it's relatively new that we're all coming together. It's been the last, I'd say, four or five months that this particular team is meeting. And I think good things will grow from that. But I think there's a bigger also policy level and governing conversation to have about it. Because what happens is need, defining need then um, also requires prioritization. Mm -hmm. That's the hard part. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of groups. It seems like this year, for whatever reason, I'm hearing more and more from that, you know, the student groups are having a harder and harder time raising money. I mean, I know the yeah. IMD group has been having, really struggling yeah. to raise money. I know, you know, the baseball team has really been putting a lot, a lot of effort into raising money, and it's just hard. It's not, and I know the robotics team, too. It just seems like it's it's getting harder for, yeah. you know, our groups to raise money. and and. I don't know what we can do to help them, but you know, even if it's just advice or how to identify a good fundraiser, how to run a good fundraiser, right. even some of that would just be helpful. I, yeah, I'm happy to explore that and how I might help in my role in supporting some of these groups. And uh, different, you, you know, different districts manage this differently. So uh, that's we can keep having that conversation. In some cases, everything goes through the foundation. And if you want to do fundraising, you work with the foundation. In other cases, the foundation offers, like you're suggesting, um, advice, expertise, suggestions. Um, you know, what we do know, and I, I'm, I know I'm speaking to the choir here because I know each of you have been involved in different projects, but the people who are most directly impacted and affected by the project and most closely related to it are the ones who are the best most passionate fundraisers. And the more removed, so for instance, if it all went through my office, the more removed it is, the less passionate volunteers are about it. So it, it's, a, it's a compromise. And that, that's yeah. why I said maybe even just giving them suggestions and help yeah. and advice and, you know, how do you pick a good fundraiser? What things yeah. should you be looking for when you're evaluating which ones that. to do? We could put that. together even a place on our website that would offer suggestions and links and support. I, I think that's a terrific idea. So we, we talk a lot on the board about, um, in addition to the work that we do, we ask a lot of our community and, you know, our host cities are incredibly generous, at the, the actual city governments, but then also our citizens. And, and, you know, when you mentioned a minute ago that there were a thousand people marching um, in the homecoming parade, and, you, you know, you're looking at seven of them um, here. Um, <laughs> It occurs to me that, so we've got a 1,000 people in the homecoming parade, yes. and you've got another two or 3,000 people probably on the sidewalks for the homecoming parade on a beautiful Friday night on Lee Road. Think about the economic impact to the restaurants oh, yeah. and yeah. stores and parking meters and although I think the city had a free parking weekend. I know, I'm sorry. Uh, so we thank you, City of Cleveland Heights, for that. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this, I, I also want to just point out that this is sort of the school district and the community of alumni yeah. and, and users and non users just kind of coming out and celebrating. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that was year three, I think, of the big yes. homecoming parade down Lee Road. Yeah. And so this is really all new money that has entered Lee Road as a result of the work of the Heights Schools Foundation building this event. So um, it is, I, I just think it's worth pointing that out to remind the community of sort of a little bit of the, the value that we're bringing back. The, and you're, you're hitting on the importance of relationships. Yes. And so we spend a lot of time building relationships and strategic partnerships. And I can't tell you today where every single one of them is going to go, but I can tell you it's good for the district that we meet with and partner with uh, business owners along Lee Road and other business districts on a regular basis. I just know that's good for us. I don't know exactly where it's headed, but homecoming was a tool for reaching out to all those local businesses who offer different kinds of specials for alumni and friends. If you wear your Tiger t-shirt, you get 20% off, oh, and whatever. So many all of the businesses these are owned by alums. Absolutely. And then that's made it possible for them to open up their doors and host events on behalf of the district and the foundation and on and on and on. And, that, and we're just 
really getting started. That's how I feel about it. And I love when you see them all displaying their Tiger Nation signs in their windows. Yes, mm -hmm. and they love it too. That's part of what is so special about the growing collaboration here is they really feel like partners in this, and they are. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. And now we'll move on to the superintendent's update. Right. So I um, have some updates to share uh, based on what we've been doing uh, in the month of December. Um, I have uh, had all but one teacher focus group uh, as a part of uh, my entry plan, which is concluding because I'll be presenting my findings in our January work session. The last group that I'll be meeting with is Oxford, which will be tomorrow. Um, also during that last week before a break, um, I was able to work with the principals to organize student focus groups at all of the schools um, and had participants as young as five. Excellent. All the way through, you know, high school age students as well. So had got really great feedback from that and saw some really interesting consistencies in terms of what students were saying, what teachers were talking about. Um, also, uh, we did have our first uh, KinderNet planning meeting. Uh, Kathan is leading yes. that effort. Um, sure. And so she'll be working with principals on upcoming kindergarten information nights uh, that will be happening. Our, um, our nutrition partner did conduct uh, district-wide surveys on um, food, food services, and opinions that also came up in the student focus groups in particular. Uh, that team also came and met with the superintendent's cadre, and we had a really rich discussion. The students got really great information. They also got some great feedback from the students, and that team is going to go out to some specific, the Canterbury, Canterbury Elementary Student Council in particular has a special request in to meet with them. Hmm. Um, so they'll be going uh, back to, to meet with those students as well. So really great sessions. Um, also um, in December, I met with a group of staff members across all of our schools to look at our current mentorship models that we have in the district to see, you know, an audit of the different types of supports that we provide to students, the different models, different groups of students. From that group, we have a smaller steering committee that's going to start working on a district framework for student mentoring in particular. So I anticipate that that will be something that will be a part of um, our 2025 strategic plan, but started laying the groundwork for that. Uh, as mentioned in our opening comments, we did hold uh, during the week right before a break that Monday and Tuesday equity, uh, equity meetings at both Monticello Middle School and then we had the same meeting um, at Roxborough Middle School. We had parents from, at, from both schools actually at both of those sessions depending on their <laughs> schedules. Um, so we uh, shared our analysis that we shared at, at the last board meeting. Uh, took questions, got their feedback, uh, received some next steps that uh, we are to take, and specifically some, re some research questions that came up to help inform the analysis. Um, and then there's also some, um, some things we're working on uh, as it relates to opening up club opportunities after school for students that aligns actually with some of the, the work of, from the foundation too as well. So um, I'm not sure if both of the speakers are here, but I'll be sending those notes out to you all uh, so you know everything that was captured at each of the subsequent meetings and then also the next steps too. So you'll see the Roxborough notes, they'll see the Monticello notes, and they agreed upon next steps. And I'll also add a timeline per the request uh, for tonight too. And then finally, um, our supervisor of communications has been working really, really hard over the break and before to get our uh, quality profile out. So she okay. does have copies for board members. Oh, all right. um, these will Thank be mailed you. out to each of the households in Cleveland Heights, University Heights. And I know Kathy can speak to, it's gonna be, the stitching is gonna be a bit different yeah. for the mailing, but we wanted to give you an early advanced copy. We'll also have copies of this on hand for our uh, school funding form that's held that will be this Thursday at 7 o'clock p.m. in the high school. Please continue to spread the word. Um, lots of information uh, that the board will be sharing around um, at Choice and its Impact um, and the district finances and the directions that we need to go um, as a result. So uh, that concludes my, my report. There are some other items. Um, uh, that I will be following up, following up on when when I have my work session. So, a um, couple things. I'm so excited about the um, 
early steps of um, the, kin the return of Kindernet and the, the uh, revitalization of Kindernet. And I, I hope that um, we, as a board member, can, as board members, can sort of divide up those um, kindergarten um, information nights and, and as, as we've done with things in the past and try to make sure that at least one of us is, is present at each one of those. The earlier we can get, that we get dates on that, the more likely it'll be, obviously. And, and then I was thinking about the equity meetings, which are so, um, so very important. And something that you said struck me that, that um, we're having uh, equity meetings at Rocks and at Monty, and that sometimes if it, it works better for a schedule, you have parents from, from Monty attending the meeting at Rocks or vice versa. And I, I'm just wondering, just sort of putting it out there, that might we be better off to really just have equity meetings? Yeah, that's one next step that came out of both of those meetings, that, to do one collective meeting. Yeah, so I mean, I think that step. if we can really start thinking about the middle school program of study, we, we might, that, that in and of itself might um, begin to take down some of the... Um, uh, inequity or, or you know and perceptions thereof and the us us and thems and it, it just becomes a greater us mm -hmm. um, just so, something that kind of came to my mind so now on our agenda is the second reading of policies group a so dr. Lombardo good evening good evening Paul. Good evening. Uh, you may recall last month I brought forward uh, Group A, there were 14 policies in our first reading. Uh, I bring those 14 back to you. Uh, this is a second reading. Uh, you know as a board you won't take action until next month, which would be the third reading. Um, but I'm here to answer any questions or if there's anything that has come up uh, since we've last uh, had our first reading. So I had a question about... Um 8462, student abuse and neglect. Yes. Um, so in the um, first section where there's a series of job titles, sort of, you know, for nurses, teachers, counselors, school psychologists, et cetera, and then it goes on and it finishes, that, that um, sentence finishes with sort of the, the, um, the big basket, you know, and it says, and any other personnel that the board determines appropriate. And, you know that these in services will be will be provided to them, and then it, I noticed that further down, um, toward the end, where it talks about the ongoing um, trainings that will happen, and yes. the, sort of the second to the last area where it says additional trainings will occur every two years thereafter. Um, Am I in the right place now? Yeah. Yes, two and then five years right. for school safety, violence prevention, and so on. Yeah. Um, oh, wait a minute. No, there was something else. Oh, all newly, I'm sorry, right above there, all newly employed mental health providers, nurses, teachers, a list of job titles. Um, it doesn't have the same language and everyone else that the board that the board determines necessary and I wonder if that might be helpful to be added there the, as for new hires so basically just everybody not just those job classifications might we want to add the 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 large basket verbiage there um, the, um, any other personnel that the board determines appropriate as new hires yeah what um Okay, what page? I just so want to make sure I capture. Page good, and I can email you this. Also. Yeah, why don't if you can yeah. email that to me? But yeah, we're um, and actually, um, Miss Kirby, we've been looking at um, we have our public school works, mm -hmm. and uh, depending on the classification, depends on um, what level of training is done, and things are done on a two-year rotation or a five-year rotation. Everyone new in the district does get some sort of training like this so we're we're looking to see if possibly that training should just be across the board mm -hmm. um, as this new policy comes forth and then uh, another question is um, we're involved in consortium consortia 
plural of consortium? Well, we are a consortium we, of districts. Got it. Right. <laughs> so if our students, um, as, as our students attend, um, uh, you know, uh, CTE program in another district, um, we're all operating under the same general Ohio law. So, so whoever is in front of the classroom is getting something similar. Yes. It may be at a different, a different pace or what have you, but we're comfortable knowing that all of Clevenite students are being, uh, you know, being educated by people with roughly the same trainings. Yes, true. Any other questions or discussion on the second reading of policies, Group A? Just I'm glad that we have added in, you know, non-tobacco forms mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. nicotine that, you know, all of the places where that gets added in is, is good. Um, Excellent. Okay. Thrilled to see the change in federal law. Taking the minimum age yes. to 21. Yeah. Yes. It's so nice to say something good. I was going to say, we law. started. <laughs> so, see, Cleveland Heights was on the forefront for that one. Yes. So. Mm. yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And I think you stay up here for the final reading mm -hmm. of the 2021 and 21 22 school calendars. Yes. Um, we brought forth. Um, as our board policy says, we should. We brought forth uh, two recommendations for the next two years of our calendars. It was vetted through our, uh, our committee. Um, we uh, did give it 30 days, and um, we're ready to uh, make the final acceptance um, if the board chooses for the 2021 and 2122 calendars. Did you get any feedback from the community on that when it was posted? I know it was up for 30 days. Just curious what kind of feedback yeah, you there received. Was, yeah, there was a little spreadsheet oh. um, with some of them. Yeah, uh, there was a spreadsheet with some items. Most people were um, wanted the school to start a little bit later than it did. That was the majority of those. People were talking about Labor Day. Again, we, as a committee, we I think we did the best we could by moving it um, later one week, mm -hmm. staying in line with... Um, some of the other schools that were in the CTE schools and, and around the areas they start between August 19th and the 26th mm -hmm. So we stayed within that range. So we are moving it a little bit later in August um, that many of the people um, that responded like that um, But other than that I uh, I think P uh, another comment was when we do our professional development days either do on a Monday or a, or a Friday to extend the weekend That's what some people asked um, but other than that, that was okay. pretty much the comments. And we are coordinating with our five school consortium when we're looking at dates or trying to when we're working on our calendars. Yes. Okay. And there was a letter sent to every district that we sent students to, and they had an opportunity <coughs> to respond back. And they just signed off that they appreciated us notifying them. Mm -hmm. yeah, and especially when it comes to testing time. Right. Because we know that if students have to stay at their home school, because of state testing, then they're not coming to their CTE location for class, and that's very disruptive for the the teaching schedule, and it can right. be very messy. Right. Yep. Okay. And people sometimes don't realize that we have PD days on election day. Those are, you know, right. Those, right. Are, those are Tuesdays, which seems, you know, if you don't realize that it's election day and the buildings are closed because we we host election day, it, it's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is not specific to these master calendars, but um, I know that there's been some conversation about whether the athletic signing day and the mm -hmm. career tech ed commitment day can be in any way combined or made part of some other larger day when we have all of our seniors being recognized for what comes next. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of a higher, like a different high school level um, logistics question. And there, there's probably lots of um, outside forces determining when those events happen. But, you know, I've attended both a CTE signing and, a, and an athletic signing where 
the number of students was very small and the number of parents was very small. And so only the families directly affected were aware of what was going on. And if they were a combined event, then we would have larger attendance and it would help to uh, broaden people's awareness of all the different things which are going on at the, at the high school when it comes to seniors and what's next for those kids. And we can bring that feedback back to the high school and yeah. uh, high school yeah. administration to look into those types of things. I know Joe, Joe D'Amato. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's, in it's been a conversation he, he, that we've had over and over again. It's like, okay, power. well, now the right people need to actually discuss it yeah. as opposed to it just being a wouldn't it be nice if kind of conversation. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah, I know he's looking into seeing how we can coordinate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if OHSAA is involved in that. Or Probably. I'm sure they, I'm sure yeah, they I'm will sure. be if they, if they feel <laughs> they can be. Well, I know they determine some of the dates for eligibility for, and yeah. for the athletic signing. And NCAA yeah. for that matter, too. I, right. I can tell you that that's not Dr. Lombardo's area to do. So yes. this no. is a conversation we have to have. It's okay. I love with uh, the right conversation. People. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now it's just I calendar do, got me sparked I do need that. a motion to approve the following mm. calendars. So the 2021 and 21-22 school year. So do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have second. a second? Any other discussion on that? Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll? Ms. Ray? Yes. Mr. Posh? Yes. Mr. Hines? Yes. Ms. Serini? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. And now we will move to the treasurer's report. Mr. Gaynor. Uh, so just two things uh, in my report. One is the 5 year forecast that we have here for action. Um, no changes uh, in this month's forecast from the previous one. Still all the ugly voucher deductions and all those kinds of things that we have going on, but nothing um, nothing new and substantive to this forecast versus the previous one. Um, and the other um, quick thing I'll note is that um, the CAFR is done. Uh, mm -hmm. We were here on New Year's Eve day and, and got that completed, so I want to thank yeah. Kathan and everyone uh, who helped us complete this document. We. It will be up on the website uh, in short order, but we do have some hard copies available in my office. So if you'd like a hard copy uh, of the document, please let me know. But And we've submitted it, um, again, for awards consideration as well. A little light reading. Typically, a little light reading. Yes. Yeah. I know, Molly, you've read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one I've read is two years old yeah, now. I need a new one to read through. Okay, so do I have a motion to approve the five-year forecast? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? I just want to say out loud in front of a microphone that according to this projection, we will be losing over $15 million to high school, no, to all vouchers in fiscal year 24. And $15 million is an enormous amount of money, and people need to be aware of that. And I would like to add that since the passage of our last levy. I asked Mr. Gaynor to pull this number together. The Cleveland Heights University Heights School District has sent a total of $38.3 million to vouchers since the passage of our last levy. Again, this is money that is hijacked from our budget, the budget that supports our programs and our students and our desks and our schools. And um, so again, anybody saying out loud that um, vouchers do not diminish the budget of the Cleveland Heights, University Heights public schools is expressing with their mouth things that they do not have uh, a knowledge of. I know that when we talk about the discussion of vouchers, it's really emotional. Yeah. And it brings a lot of, um, you know, varying emotions, including anger. The one thing I do want to say is that uh, one of the greatest attributes of our community is our you know, diverseness and our inclusiveness. And I think that vouchers have the potential to really tear communities apart and pit people against each other. I don't want to see that happen here. We're too good for that. Um, and if people are angry about the vouchers, they really need to direct their anger at the people who are responsible, our lawmakers. Um, if you're mad about vouchers, don't direct it at your neighbor, don't direct it at your friend who's taking a voucher, but make sure that you make your voice heard to our lawmakers because they're the ones who put us in this terrible position 
by adopting policies that were not fully vetted or fully thought out. Or yeah. fully funded. Or fully funded. I mean, that's, that's the, right. the that's largest the reality. unfunded no, state mandate we yeah. have. Yeah. Yeah. The problem isn't the voucher user. It's the, it's the people in Columbus that the wrote the law that way. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Well, and, yeah. and I think we have to be real careful. There's a lot of messages on social media about vouchers, and there's a lot of misinformation specific around the, the term. Um, it's not costing the CHUH school district for one penny of the voucher because what happens is the voucher gets paid by the state. Okay, so half of that statement is true. I mean, the voucher is paid by the state, but what's missing in all this conversation is the deduction that happens on our end that enables right. this, the state to make that payment. They deduct it out of our foundation. So it is a cost to us, and the foundation is fixed. It's not going up. So every new student that takes a voucher, 100% of the money is indirectly coming out of our five-year forecast and what we've budgeted for, which is what we have to do by state law. It's and that's something we're going to co cover in our funding forum on Thursday night, so I do encourage everybody to be there who can, because we do give a specific example of how, how that impacts us, which I think makes it... Um, understandable for people because frankly people see a sh you know they see a spreadsheet they see large numbers they don't understand what it means child by child and so we do an example like that yeah absolutely so tell your friends and neighbors to please come to the high school january 9th at seven o'clock in the auditorium and attend the, the forum to become a more uh, you know more educated about school funding and be informed so any additional discussion on the Forecast? Oh. We have to vote on it. We do. Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll? Mr. Posh. Uh, yes. Mr. Hines. Yes. Ms. Serini. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Ms. Wright. Yes. Okay. The board president's report is going to be very short tonight because I didn't know until a little bit ago that I was going to be the president again. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but uh, I do want to remind everyone, I said we have the forum on Thursday night, so please be there, high school, 7 o'clock. Um, also, we have a board retreat on January 25th that will take place here in this room. So um, everybody, please put that on your calendars. That was something we set up uh, almost a year ago to have quarterly uh, retreats. I am going to make one last plea for everyone to please complete your strength finders. Um, uh, notice that we're all sighing. Yes, we have. Um, I think it will help us, though, to work together better, understand each other. Not, you know, we, it, it'll just it'll just help us. It doesn't take that long, and I think you will get a lot of insight into yourself and we, your strengths. We reelected you so that you could beat us into shape. <laughs> Can we well, change this election? <laughs> <laughs> The whole thing about strength finders is identifying what your strengths are and being able to work together as a team in the best way possible by utilizing all your strengths. And I think it's important we do that. Um, if you can't find your original email from, from Rosalind, please let her know and I'm sure she will dig it out and send it to you. So please complete this. Feel You'll be free glad to you did. text You'll, me and remind me to do that. You'll <laughs> thank me afterwards. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm inviting you to your life, Dan. Thank Here we you. go. <laughs> so that's it for the president's report. Um, board committee reports. Do we have any tonight? Um, career and tech ed. Um, hang on, I just lost my calendar. God. All right, hang on. I got to go back, back, back. One of the other things we can do on the retreat is look at our board assignments and see mm -hmm. if we want to, you know, readjust those in any way. I can, while Molly's looking, I can say that we have um, uh, gotten a, a roster of folks for the advocacy committee. Oh, that's um, good. So that is uh, um, on the calendar at this point. We have, we have a date for our first advocacy committee meeting, which is, um, which is excellent. We ha again... We're so blessed in this community with people with such a, a, a wide variety of, of abilities and experiences and passions. So um, very, very interested in getting that up and running again. Um, and the uh, facilities committee is, uh, I think that the deadline for applicants has been extended. Yes. 
Okay, so the equity task force met on the 11th of December, and then we have breakout meetings coming up uh, for individual subsets, and equity marketing will be meeting Thursday at 1. The Career Tech Ed Advocacy Group will be meeting uh, next week, Wednesday the 15th, at 7 o'clock, University Heights Library on Cedar Road. Um, the Reaching Heights Board of Directors is meeting Tuesday the 14th at 7 o'clock at Coventry. Um, the Coventry tenants all had a meeting, was it last night? Yes, it was last night, sorry, yesterday afternoon. Um, uh, where they discussed possible uh, financial models for how to take, uh, to, to run the building themselves separate from the library, and all that are decisions they need to make, but at some point it may or may not affect some of our community partners like Reaching Heights. But right now, um, it, it won't make, it doesn't affect us yet at all, so. Any other committee reports? If not, let's move on to new business. And on new business, I know we have a resolution that Mr. Heinz would like to introduce. Um, so I would um, just once again restate my statement that I know this it can be a very emotional topic. It's a resolution um, opposing expansion of Ed Choice vouchers. While I wholeheartedly oppose the expansion, I also, once again, um, want to direct my anger at our lawmakers for the position they put us in. So, Mr. Heinz, will you introduce your resolution? Yes. Thank you. Um, this is a resolution opposing the expansion of Ed Choice vouchers by the Ohio General Assembly. Whereas, with no testimony, no prior notice, and little explanation, the Ohio General Assembly added a last minute amendments regarding the expansion of Ed Choice vouchers before approving HB 166, the state's biennial budget. And whereas because of this action, Ed Choice vouchers are now available to any and every K-12 student in Ohio, regardless of grade level and or whether or not he or she has ever attended a public school. And whereas just 18 months ago, just 5% of the districts in the state of Ohio qualified for Ed Choice uh, vouchers, 70% of districts in Ohio now have schools designated as Ed Choice schools. And whereas much of the data used to make the new Ed Choice determination is five or six years old, and came from assessments that the state no longer uses or is considering changing. And whereas elected officials in Columbus froze public school budgets in the new biennial budget and, at the same time, took money away from public schools by significantly and substantially increasing the number of students eligible to receive Ed Choice vouchers placing many school districts on the brink of financial emergency and uncertainty. And whereas Ed Choice imposes unfair burdens on local taxpayers who should not have to carry the millstone of the state's efforts to subsidize private and parochial schools, and whereas the legislative machinations used to pass the Ed Choice expansion suggest a deliberate choice to undermine public schools and to shut out the voices of local communities. Therefore, be it resolved that we demand immediate financial relief be provided to districts disproportionately impacted by Ed Choice vouchers, that the state not deduct Ed Choice scholarship payments from school district funds and should directly pay for some or all of the new vouchers added to the program this year. That a cap be placed on the amount of money that can be deducted from a district in any given year. And that the Ed Choice program be reined in 
so that it makes more sense for students, families, and taxpayers without decimating public school districts. Therefore, be it resolved that the Cleveland Heights University Heights City School Board of Education <coughs> urges all lawmakers in the state of Ohio to refrain from approving any new legislation or attaching any version thereof before the original legislation has been properly vetted and heard by both chambers of the Ohio General Assembly according to the rules established by the Ohio Constitution. Do I have a motion to approve the resolution? So moved. Second. Any discussion? We have to discuss this, guys. <laughs> I and feel I like know, we've been discussing it forever and, and ever, but and, yes. And, and I know in the meeting that we're all preparing for next Thursday night, or this coming Thursday, Thursday night, there's plenty of conversation about Ed Choice vouchers. Um, I think we need to remember that the whole reason Ed Choice was put in is as a relief for families so their children didn't have to attend a school that was designated as a failing school. And when you look at 70% of the school districts in Ohio have a failing school, you got to wonder, are there really that many failing schools? Um, I mean, our high school was put on the Ed Choice list because of our graduation rate. Using the data that is specified in this resolution, it's stale old data. Um, because the newer data wasn't good enough, mm -hmm. okay? They had to go back mm -hmm. to kids that are 26 years old and 25 years old and ignoring any of the work that we've done to increase our graduation rate, which, by the way, is above the state average, okay? You're, you're not above the state average in, in considering a, a, a failing school. Um, I mean, there's, there's games that are getting played here, and it's... Um, I mean, we know this levy would be significant lower, lower or not needed at all mm -hmm. if there was no ed choice. We had a gentleman here mm -hmm. earlier today complaining that it's too much. And I get that. And yeah, of course we take all this into consideration when we put it on, on, on you know, make an important decision to put a levy like this on the ballot. It hits our families too. Yeah, yeah. but if this law was not out there, and if the laws out there were structured so um, we wouldn't have to have school levies to deal with any kind of inflation, um, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't need school levies. I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. Um, I, as Jody said, you know, the problem is not the existence of vouchers or the users of vouchers or the schools where the vouchers are used. The problem with vouchers is that the money that a, somebody who lives in Cleveland Heights who uses a voucher, the problem is that that money comes out of the funding for the Cleveland Heights University Heights Public Schools. If the state of Ohio wants to fund vouchers, go separate. for it. But do it from the general yeah. funds, it be a not pot from of money. not yeah. from the funds that are directed to local school districts. And it is the deduction. And I was thinking, Jim, as you were talking earlier, about you know that that people don't understand that the money is deducted from what we get. It's sort of similar to to an argument that says, no, federal taxes don't reduce how much money is in my paycheck or how much money my family has to spend. Well, of course they do. It shows you right in my paycheck that they, that they deducted my federal taxes be before they, they gave me my, my uh, amount. It is, it's exactly the same model. So, yes, problem's not the people using them. Problem's not the schools that are accepting them. The problem is that the law says that that money comes out of funds designated for public schools. And we all know our school funding system is broken. Absolutely. It's been declared unconstitutional multiple times. No one stepped up to fix it. And nobody seems really interested in Columbus in doing a sincere study of 
how are the other 49 states funding public education? It's, you know, the United States of America is, is a great opportunity to look out, look around and see what's working here. What can we borrow from Pennsylvania? What can we borrow from Michigan? What can we borrow from Colorado? There's nobody doing that work as far as I can tell. I mean, there's the Cup Patterson uh, model, which has some very, very good points. It would fund vouchers from outside of the education budgets. Um, but, you know, this is really, really hard work that somebody needs to step up and do. And, and the advocacy efforts that we've been doing for the past two years as the board is currently um, uh, positioned and before, really, but certainly for the last two years, we've been aggressively advocating on behalf of this and other issues. Um, a critical mass seems to be assembling, that's for sure. Well, I mean, they've overreached. Yes. I mean, which, which, is, which is kind of funny, and, you know, it, 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 this is bound to sort of implode upon themselves. Um, we know we have families that leave Cleveland Heights to go to Solon, mm -hmm. okay? Because the perception in Solon is you don't have failing schools in Solon, okay? But here you have Solon schools now on the Ed Choice list, Yep. Okay? And we know that the D that we get on the state report card is not an accurate reflection of what's going on. And we know a D in another school district, they could have completely different metrics that they have to meet in order to earn that D or not get that D. So, I mean, the scale isn't even accurate. Right. So it's, it, it's interesting just to sort of see how these affluent schools that generally perform well on the state test because that's really what they're designed to right. promote because we all know that. Um, it's, it's, it's just interesting to see how these other schools um, are um, now showing up on this list and now we're not the only people out there trying to beat this. Yes, we're not the only ones in Columbus now. So. No. Yeah, our, welcome you know, to the club nobody wants to be in. Well, right. But it's, <laughs> but it's 70 you know, it's of the about school the districts are now in this club. Which, and and uh, so it's also yeah. about the measurements that put a district, that give a district a simple A, B, C, D, F mm -hmm. uh, rating. You know, our high school is now an Ed Choice High School because somehow nobody in Columbus is aware that we're one of nine districts that the that uh, college a, boards right, just recognize as extraordinary yeah. because what does AP know about college? Oh, wait, a lot. Um, you know, and, and that our schools that are struggling, but, you know, we just had these incredible kids up here tonight, and we recognize those fantastic teachers who are guiding them through incredible lessons and taking them to Costa Rica and Baltimore. Um, but those things never show up in the report cards that the state gives out, you know, and which is a wonderful opportunity for everybody to take a really good hard look at the quality profile, which is a much more local report reflecting the values of this community. How is this school district, these teachers and these students, what, what is the work happening in our classroom um, what does that look like, and how does it reflect the values of this community and these taxpayers? So, um, you know, what a wonderful opportunity to have this in front of us, because, boy, as we talk about measurements that matter, these are the things, I think, that are really important to the community. But, gosh, that funding system that Columbus is inflicting upon our taxpayers needs to change. And that's the reason our taxes are so high. Yep. It's the reason we have to continue to ask for levies. Yes. And frankly, the way vouchers are being funded is not sustainable. No. So even, you know, the neighbors that are taking vouchers really need to get involved and help request it be funded a different way because yeah. otherwise the whole system is going to implode and everybody's going to end up with nothing. Right. So, Mr. Gaynor, will you take the roll so we can vote on the resolution? Ms. Wright? Yes. Mr. Posh? Yes. Mr. Himes? Yes. Ms. Serini? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. All right. Is there any unfinished business? Um, I just wanted to briefly mention that.
the big stage rigging project at Monty Middle School is done. Thank you. So everything has been rehung. The new drapes have been installed. Um, and Heights Youth Theater had their rehearsal on stage yesterday. So that's terrific. And we'll move on to Rocks over spring break. And I personally want to thank you, Malia, for yes. being really involved in that yes. project. Um, Save I take, all has a lot of I money. take it personally when a theater isn't put together properly. What can I say? <laughs> and Juliana's not here anymore, but I'd like to thank her too because I understand she's the been foundation, instrumental. Yes, um, was also very involved in that project and helped supported it. So, I'd like to thank both of you and everybody else who's been involved. And George Petkak has also been instrumental because he lets me whine about all the things I need and gets them for me. So. Thank you, George. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other unfinished business? How about correspondence and announcements? Any of those? Um, the only uh, correspondence and announcement I will um, I have is just that um, I received a lovely thank you letter from Yvonne Wallace, the librarian at Noble, for those of us who went oh, and read to her classroom yes, yes. Um, to the so library. Much. And we were invited to do that whenever we want. Any she, Friday yeah, we're not any working. Friday, yes. She gave me a list of dates that I will pass on to everyone that, you know, or not dates, but times, mm -hmm. that any day in the school year on these times, you, we are welcome to come and read. The so. kids were wonderful. How old, yeah. what, what grade levels? Kindergarten. kindergarten. We read to kindergarten, but she, the list that she put She has in all the, the classes is, through, so you could yeah. hit any, yeah. you know, on Fridays she gets all the grades. Okay, cool. So it was very fun. I quite enjoyed that. So is there, if there's nothing else, I think uh, I can get a motion to adjourn. I would like to motion that we adjourn. Second. Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll? Mr. Bosch. Yes. Mr. Hines. Yes. Ms. Serini? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Wright? Yes. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.